is that there is a lot to gain learn and life itself is a big experience i am 100% certain the next coming one hour or one and a half hours is going to be a great learning experience we are going to listen to him visualize where is geographical position of india china in Ch indian ocean china how strategically it is important how the changing global scenario of politi american president or whatever political environment is all influencing it's for you to listen reflect on that ask questions i am confident that any question he will answer that is a level of competence we have with our speaker today and sir we request you to take over thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you very much and uh, so very kind of you for those lovely words good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen i hope uh, i can be heard i can be heard just raise your hand yes sir. okay thank you uh, welcome to this uh, beautiful uh, friday evening amidst thunder and rain showers to the topic called the growing influence of china in the indian ocean when i spoke to dr thomas first about the subject i was reminded of a small little situation where the house owner wants to build a house and he contacts an architect the house owner tells the architect that i want the beautiful house so the architect asks how much space he says 10 cents i want a huge house spacious rooms my wife wants a huge kitchen garden my children should be able to walk around there should be sun wind and you know the ocean must be here this is almost like the most impossible task given to an architect to build it was something like this that dr thomas gave me this task nothing is impossible let me try and do my best and cover this subject with all the queries that you raised in the last one week i'll try and address all of them we as indians have got used to being fed this amazing pictures of the growing intimate relationship between honorable prime minister narendra modi and the chinese premier xi jinping till 2014 in may every indian carried a sort of a unhealable wound scar of the tremendous treachery that we suffered way back in 1962 when prime minister modi took over and stormed the world with his diplomatic initiatives we thought the worst is over and we are going to be at par with china as two emerging superpowers both from asia and both neighbors it was so there were minor irritants but on the 15th of june 2029 the indian and chinese soldiers clashed in the galvan valley 16th early morning television sets were a bus with the news that there has been some problem in the galvan valley in east and ladakh and there have been casualties by about 7 o'clock it was confirmed that four indian soldiers had made the supreme sacrifice but there were a lot of rumors saying that many more are injured but there was no news from the government but by 9:30 at night the last report confirmed that 17 more soldiers made the supreme sacrifice for the country and the loss to the 20 the government immediately came and said nobody else is injured but 40 chinese soldiers have been killed and later they said no incursions have happened in the ladakh valley what is most striking in this incursion or this scuffle was that two nuclear armies were engaged in a primitive stone age fight 
it actually surprised the whole world. Why two armies are fighting hand to hand with machete sticks and boulders? That's a different matter altogether for another discussion. This is out of the purview of this discussion. But ever since that day, the relationship between the two fond brothers, newfound relationship has not fractured. We have been only hearing about de-escalation, de uh, disengagement, military talk and action, diplomacy all over the world. But the sad fact is tension prevails. More than a lakh each of combatant personnel with tactical and strategic weapons are face to face bearing the unbearable cold of the icy whole Himalayas. We will not know what happened. The reality that bites us today is that from 2014 till 2020, there have been 18 different meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping. In fact, our Prime Minister has visited China five times as a Prime Minister, the most for any Indian Prime Minister till date. What went wrong? To understand the entire gambit of India-China relationship, I would like to take you along first to the, prim the primary issues of sovereignty, borders, and what ails the India-China relationship before we take a dip into the Indian Ocean. We must understand the concept of sovereignty. Every country, nation state of the world is entitled to being sovereign state. A sovereign state is allowed to have an organized government or has an organized government, has a right to exist without interference and has a right to defend against threat to sovereignty. But sovereignty as we understand physically are bound in the boundaries of the land, the sea or the maritime boundaries and the national airspace. What is the la India's land boundary? For most of us who do not know, we share the international border between Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and Myanmar. International border are predetermined well accepted lines of demarcation between two nation states. There cannot be a dispute because it is already settled. However, between us and Pakistan, we also have something called the LC and the AGPL. LC or the LOC, line of control, starts, if you see the IB start from Gujarat, comes up to Rajasthan, into Punjab and comes into Jammu and Kashmir to a place called Sangam. That is ahead of ahead of uh, Jammu and goes right up to a place called NJ 9842. NJ 9842 is a marking on the map. It is not marked on the ground, but marking on the map. From NJ 9842, it goes right up to Indira Kaul, which is about 18,900 odd feet. It is named after Goddess Lakshmi. And after that, when you turn east, we get into a place called the LAC or the Line of Actual Control. The Siachen Glacier, the famous Siachen Glacier is here. With China, we have the LAC. In the western sector, we have Ladakh. The central sector or the middle sector of the LAC is Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. And the eastern sector is with Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim. For those of you, who don't have much idea of the map, I thought I must show you that also. This is the IB, this is the LC, and this is the LAC. Now coming to the waterfront, the mankind boundaries. We'll ask, where do you draw a line on water? Yes, there is a line on water. 12 kilometers from the shoreline, base shoreline, into the ocean or sea is an extension of the sovereign water, sovereign land. That water belongs purely to the country. 
12 nautical miles after the territorial waters is what is called as contiguous waters. This also belongs to the country if it has been claimed and accepted by the international body. In India's case, we have claimed and it is accepted by the world over. Ahead of this 24 nautical miles, up to 200 nautical miles is what is called as exclusive economic zone over which we have the right to explore. We can take the natural resources. It is purely us. But all these waters allow what is called as innocent passage. Any ship, any vessel can pass provided it is making an innocent passage. So where do you draw a line in air? The vertical column of air above your land boundary and the maritime boundary, the territorial waters belongs to the country. But at to what height? Nobody has ever year marked. But it is normally considered 30 kilometers, 160 kilometers, and 100 kilometers is what separates the Earth's atmosphere with outer space. It's called the Kerman line. In honor of Theodor von Kerman, Hungarian physicist, who actually made this distinction. Let us get into the topic of the day, the Indian Ocean. Again, for MBA students who might be coming from various walks of educational fields, let me explain to you just the layout of the Indian Ocean so that we understand it properly. The Indian Ocean is here. You can see the mouse moving. To the east, the ocean is Pacific Ocean. If you find the Pacific Ocean written here also, that is because the globe is round and it is the same ocean. To the west is the ocean called Atlantic Ocean. To the south is Atlantic uh, and uh, Antarctic Ocean or the Southern Ocean. But if you look at the boundaries of Indian Ocean, we have to the west, the African continent, to the north, the Asian continent, to the south, uh, to the east is uh, the Australian continent, and to the south is Antarctica. Ladies and gentlemen, for your knowledge, the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, Andaman Sea, Lakadiv Sea, Somalian Sea, they're all part of the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean, first being Pacific, second being Atlantic, followed by Antarctica and Arctic Ocean. So we are in the middle. It covers more than 7 crore, 5 lakh, 60,000 kilometers square, and is about 20% of the world's water. Why is uh, Indian Ocean important? If you look at the map, you'll understand the landmass around the Indian Ocean is the most densely populated landmass of the world. 60% of the world's population live as littorals to the Indian, uh, Indian Ocean. It also hosts the world's fastest growing regions. With very high rate of economic growth, the Indian Ocean is actually the crossroads of global trade. It connects major engines of international economy. If you see the Eastern African parts, the Southern African part, the Indian Ocean, the Gulf area, Australia, and of course the powerhouse of the economic powerhouse of Southeast Asia. They are all littoral to the Indian Ocean. That by itself makes Indian Ocean a flashpoint, a hotly contested property, because 40% of the world's offshore production is in the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean basin. And for your information, more than 36 million barrels of oil, crude oil, are moved up and down the Indian Ocean. That's about 64% of the world's oil trade. But what is most important for the ocean are the choke points. If you understand what is a choke point, uh, let me take your mind to the Chengannur uh, bus stand area on the MC road. You have a four-lane road coming from Kote or Tiruvalla and a four-lane road going out of Chengannur and a two-lane road in Chengannur. That is the same thing that happened 
in the mighty Indian Ocean. We have the Strait of Hormuz near the Arabian Peninsula. We have the Strait of Malacca between Malaysia and Indonesia. And we have the Strait of uh, Monday, Babel and Babel Monday state in the African area. There are the terrible choke points and therefore very strategic points of Indian Ocean. As far as India is concerned, it becomes even more important. India is in the center of the Indian Ocean. And we have more than 7,500 kilometers of coastline with the Indian Ocean. I'll take your mind back to the Mumbai incident. The terrorists also came from the Indian Ocean. There have been uncounted crossings of unwanted people into the country through the Indian Ocean. Therefore, it has serious security implications for our country. 80% of Indian oil uh, crude oil requirement has almost 3.28 million barrels of, uh, per day comes to us through Indian Ocean. That's about 95% of Indian trade by volume and 68% of trade by value to India goes out and comes into India through the Indian Ocean. See how critical for us Indian Ocean is. Let us take an adversary. China is a fast growing economy. Therefore, he is hungry for fuel. All growth, economic growth has to be fueled. The fodder is fuel. And as of today, the fuel is carbon fuel. That is crude oil. China overtook the US as the biggest importer of oil way back in 2015 with 7.4 million barrels a day. In 2019, hit, it hit 10 million barrels per day. And it's already crossed 12 million of barrels per day in 2020, when it was projected that it will be in 2021. And the entire oil is sourced mostly from Persian Gulf and is transported to the Indian Ocean. So you understand, the entire fuel, the fodder for China's growth comes through Indian Ocean. So the choke point, if it is gone, China can be hungry and gasping for breath. That is why China is taking too much of interest in the Indian Ocean. Is that the only reason? We must understand China. The entire gambit of Chinese uh, activities, if you make it into a crucible and precipitate it, it can be talked as, as a one China policy. Deng Xiaoping and the premiers before that, all people have always spoke of one China policy. Then what changed now? In October 2017, President Xi Jinping announced that it is time for China to make its claim as a global power. It must get its prominence amongst the community of nations because it is economically the super powerhouse, militarily the powerhouse, and politically as a control of most of the world. We call it hegemony. Now, how do they do it? The easiest way Chinese start, or the, the most common way China starts their expansion is by creating a new narrative called the history. They'll come out with a history of 12th century, 13th century, 15th century, but nobody knows what happened. So the question is whether it is fact or fiction, they'll make a claim on some piece of land. They will start enabling the territory by increasing their military presence on those places. Those who can't withstand slowly give up. And they start extending their land borders, boundaries, all out, outwards. 
they either use military force, they bully, or they use economic measures to get their land. What are they doing? They are actually enhancing or enlarging their land territory. They extend their borders. Meanwhile, those who are far away, what they do? They and, and hold or entrap those countries through a mechanism called debt trap. And when they, the country which has taken the debts or the loan cannot pay it back, they take ownership of what has been bought or mortgaged. The dragon is greedy. For us, for India, we have a problem in the excise chain. Our borders have an issue with them across, even in the eastern side, Arunachal Pradesh, they have claimed it. Every inch of border, they say it is disputed. Indians are not the only ones. Nepal, who is playing subservience to the Chinese empire, is already paying a heavy price for it. Tibet is already under their control. We now call the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Bhutan, they're claiming Gokulam Plateau, wherein the Indian army went and fought for them because we have a trade a treaty with Bhutan to look after them. Laos, because they say the Yuan dynasty ruled once upon a time. Mongolia, they say most of it belongs to China because Yuan dynasty ruled Mongolia. They forget that Genghis Khan from Mongolia and ruled China full. So that is not counted, but Yuan dynasty, which is done before, that is counted. The Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, Cambodia, they all have been claimed by China as part of the mainland. Even Tajikistan, which is also under claim by China. So any country which they set their eyes upon, they will make some claim. So you'll ask why, why they do it. We will discuss this in the question answer session. It's not only land, even sea is not foreign to them. China has disputed anybody and everybody at sea in the far areas with them. According to the United Nations Convention on Laws of the Sea, remember I told you, it's only up to 200 nautical miles that a country can claim. If you look at the map of China in the sea, it is about well into near the China, only 200 nautical miles. But they have staked claim on all islands in the South China Sea on one ground. They say it is South China Sea. The China Sea belongs to China. Therefore, all islands in the sea will belong to us. So they have problems with Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Taiwan. They have problems with every country which is littoral in the Indian Ocean. They coerce smaller nations to abandon their claims. They come up with a new theory called the nine dash line, which nobody knows what they mean. They keep changing it. They said this belongs to us. It's a huge country with the muscle power military muscle power, economic power, and they're bullying people into submission. Now your question would be, is South China Sea part of Indian Ocean? No, it is not. Is it marginal to Pacific Ocean? Yes, it is marginal to Pacific Ocean. Then why should India be worrying about China's actions in South China Sea? Ladies and gentlemen, let me take you to the concept of the string of pearls and the BRI or the Belt and Road Initiative. All ladies wear necklaces. Imagine that you have a necklace made of pearls and somebody is, allows you to wear it or puts a necklace on your neck and start tightening that necklace. After some time, you realize that you are slowly choking on the beautiful pearl necklace. So the string of pearls is a geopolitical theory which have been named by others, not by China. They say no, it doesn't exist. 
it is a network of officially commercial facilities established by China in their sea lines of communication. But they eventually are purely Chinese military facilities. It starts from the Chinese uh, mainland and comes into the port of Sudan. If you see, it starts from the Chinese mainland, takes on islands in the South China Sea, comes along the, just behind the Sri Lanka, the south of Sri Lanka, the, the port of Hambatoza, and goes right to Pakistan, Gwadar, and comes down to Port Sudan. Each of this port will cover those three major choke points of Indian Ocean. So remember, I, I explained to you. So China would have maritime or naval presence in each of these ports. You can actually ensure that their navy and their commercial ships can move without problems, but they can also create problems for other shipping vessels in the Indian Ocean. That is the biggest worry that we Indians have, the NATO has, and all other European countries have. How does it translate in the bigger picture for China? These are the, the boats which I explained are the string of pearls. Uh, strangely, when you say Belt and Road Initiative, the road is not the road on the land, the road of the shipping lines. And the belt are the land routes. If you look at the land routes, you'll find one getting into Pakistan, one going into the Europe. So it covers entire world, 60% of the world population gets covered by the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, giving China a reach into 33% of the world's wealth and will cover 60 countries. Imagine how China is spreading itself as a power of this world. How do we translate or how do we counter the Chinese inroads? We precisely have three models of operandi. The diplomatic uh, models, uh, uh, models, the military to military models, and the developmental aid. We have started going out with open hands, open arms, and embracing all the littoral states of the Indian Ocean. We also got into military to military strategy agreements with many, many littoral, many littoral states, thereby giving us not only a footprint, but a foothold in each one of these countries, through which we can counter physically as well as culturally and economically the impact of China in these countries. In addition, we are also giving a lot of very, very generous developmental aid to these countries. After all, relationship costs money. There is no way but to go through it. How do China do the Shylocking? If you remember, I spoke to you about how China gets people into the uh, debt trap. Exactly. A, a term coined by Brahma Chandri, a very noted uh, defense expert strategist. He used it to define the Chinese geostrategic reach and approach. Now, how do they do it? China would actually get into these countries and bid for projects. They would then actually give very generous offer. In the meantime, they would bribe the political leaders in those countries and give as much money as required by the country without any problem. 
Now, all the money that is given as the aid would be used only, only for the projects which have been given to China or Chinese companies. Ladies and gentlemen, all Chinese companies working abroad as commercial entities are purely an extension of the People's Liberation Army or the Chinese Communist Party. It's only a name, it's only a facade they have. Entire thing is owned, driven and managed by members of the Communist Chinese Party, Chinese Communist Party. They keep the conditions opaque, but nobody knows. In fact, many countries don't know how much they got and how much they have given back. The stage will come when the country cannot service the debts. There would be a default in the repayment of the loan. Then what happens? The Chinese government says, don't worry, no problem. We will take over these projects. Now it is ours. We will run it, we will maintain it, and you have to pay for using it. It is us now. So imagine you have a house which you give on a rent to somebody on some clause. He uses one room. Then he says, okay, I am giving you, you can't pay the money back. I will use three rooms. And you still haven't given the money back. He says, okay, now you can use one room. The house is mine. After some time, he will say, okay, the house may be yours, but I own it. Now you pay rent for staying in your house. This is exactly what happens to almost all the countries which has taken money from China. See the list of African countries. They just can't pay back. It is only a matter of time when these countries would become sold out. It is something like the uh, gambling that Yudhishthira did in Mahabharata. Finally, nothing will be left to these countries. Sri Lanka, having taken just $361 million, has already had to sign out the Hamantota port to China for a 99 year lease. That means that port is gone from Sri Lanka. This is what the debt trap is all about. The Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean and their activity has created uh, stress lines, has stressed the economic issues of India. So ever since the Doklam and later the Galvin Valley incident took place, there's a call for revenge across the country. You know, people burned effigies, people burned Chinese maps, people hit the posture of Xi Jinping with chapel. They're all very good, very, very emotional. And they said, boycott China, we will make in India. And we all believe it is very good. But is it practical? Is it possible? It is. But is it possible in the near future? Let us quickly go through it. Ladies and gentlemen, China overtook the entire world as a global manufacturing gen. It, it overshadowed US in the year 2010. Today, it has 28.4% of the global manufacturing output from China. Now, when we say, let us boycott China, please understand how much we import and how much we export. What is our import-export relationship with China? We import much more than what we export to China. So, to most of us, we feel if we stop import, no, in 2019-20, we imported $65,260 million of stuff from China. And from 2010 till now, our trade deficit has been increasing. In 1920, the financial year 1920, our trade deficit stood at 48,654 $48, million dollars as trade deficit. That means we imported more, 
1,654 million dollar worth thing we imported more than we exported. So when we say import from China, we can do away. Ladies and gentlemen, we are importing almost 13% of the entire import is from China. Whereas we export about 5%. But for China, they import, they export only 2.6% percent of their and their export is to India. So when we say we don't want your import, it doesn't make any difference to them. It actually doesn't. Not only the value, but look at the items say we are dealing with. Also, the foreign uh, direct investment. China has made huge investment over the last 10 years into India. Many companies have a lot of money of China pumped in. So are we going to give it back? Now, what are the items we import and export? What do we export from India to China? Very silly things, organic chemicals, pearls, precious stone, some metal. They say, okay, we don't want, our ladies will not wear pearls. Okay, we will not take your uh, silk, don't need it. We'll take from somewhere else. Your textiles, they will take it from Bangladesh. Cheaper, better. But what do we import? We import electric machinery, its parts, electronics, television equipment, forget all that. We import industrial boilers, nuclear reactors. Above all that, many of our raw materials come from China for our production. We import steel for our production from China. We import electronic components. Especially your uh, components that go into many of our high-end uh, use items. Why is Indian medicine so cheap? Because we import active pharmaceutical ingredient API from China. So when we say we will not import, we will import ban. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just talking out of emotion, not out of economic sense. Because it is when we import from China, what we import from China is only a percentage of it is consumed. We import high-end technology, mostly they have reverse engineered and now they have the patent. And most or 60 to 65 percent of Chinese imports are into value addition in India. They are only midstream or the start point of production in India. What we get cheap from uh, China, we value add, we transform, and then we export globally. That is why we are globally competitive. One major issue or the fundamental uh, strength of Indian export is cheap Chinese import. So to say and uh, put fire to their refugees is all very good, but it is actually more of hype and less of truth. Now you will say, no, no, then what, do we, what are we supposed to do? We will, we will listen to them and keep quiet. No, I never said that. There's a way ahead. The three or four types we can do. One is the ban regime. We ban import, we ban export, we ban FDI. Ladies and gentlemen, it is catastrophic. Our economy will nose dive. Hundreds and millions of people become jobless in India. So do we keep quiet? Or do we start spreading other stories? No, everything is okay. Is that a viable option? No. The most mature nuanced strategy is to follow the path of self-reliance and get into make in India. Now there is a misconception about make in India. We'll clarify it as we go ahead. Make in India is not necessarily that we make everything from scratch, from the first ingredient to the last ingredient in India. What we are talking of make in India or Atma Nirbhada, Nirbhada is about being self-reliant. We find different sets of sources and set in place a foundation of a robust economy. 
A robust economy has three major parts. The agriculture, the manufacturing, and the servicing industry. 100% indigenous production, it is possible, but a very, very costly probability. We'll have to prioritize. What do we do 100% here? What do we do otherwise? Because if we have to have production for everything, then we have to have technology. It costs money. Developmental costs are phenomenal. And if you're only doing what we want in India, then we'll go back to the days of Ambassador Khan and uh, Premier Patmini and only Doordarshan. Therefore, we have to actually believe that we must have external linkages and dependence on other outside agencies. It is inevitable. But the smart act is to balance it well between each source. Only then we can liberate the upstream downstream linkages and get the best value for the country. So the answer is mobism versus pragmatism. Very good to go for votes and fight and shout and down, down China, up, up India. But it is very good to be pragmatic. Therefore, to have India turn into a manufacturing hub, we must look at converting India or transforming India, the, the core parts of production or the factors of production. What are the factors of production? The land, the labor, the capital and the entrepreneurship. If you don't have raw materials in India, you must find cheap sources. If you don't have technology in-house, we must make it or we must get it. An issue is power. We have a serious issue of 24 hour power in this country. Logistics, cold chain, hot chain, and the roads, and above all the market. But what interests the whole world is the regulatory practices. How law takes its course when there is a dispute with, between land for land, for labor, or for capital. But what affects most each one of you and me is the education levels and employability. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ask anybody in Kerala today, of the 100 people you ask, 98 would be graduates, 50 would be engineers, 20 would be doctors. The point is, is each engineer employable in the engineering aspect? Is each doctor employable as a competent doctor? That is the output to the education that we have. Unfortunately, our education system is based on marks. The road where you mug up, you, you write back or you copy, not on skills. Not on skills, but on getting marks. That's all that we do. The last question that I was asked was the impact of the presidential election of the, in America, how that would impact, what is the impact of the presidential election on India-China relationship? Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I don't know who is the president now, what will happen to the presidential election. There are a lot of stories going around, but whatever happens, it actually makes no difference. I read about 600 odd pages based on President Trump's interviews with various agencies. If you remember the first interview he gave in December 2, 2016 to the Wall Street Journal, he had said that he had a talk with the Taiwan president. Taiwan, for example, for your knowledge, is not recognized as a country by China and not even by UN. That was a start point. And every second day, uh, Trump will say something nasty about China. But if you look at uh, all the interviews of Trump and the previous administration's activities, ladies and gentlemen, nothing has changed. 
Trump only made many noises. All activities of the American, the American China relationship are exactly the same, in the same lines as was being done before. What colors our view about Biden was in 2001, Biden went to China and helped China get entry into the World Trade Organization. And he had made it very clear that China must play by the rules of the game. But today, he says China is a dictatorship. He's already threatened China that there will be economic sanctions if China tries to impede on American interests. So a Republican counselor had said, if you close your eyes and listen to Biden and to uh, Trump and cut out the sound and the, and the fury, essentially they speak the same thing. Because US interests will always be foremost. They don't care where India gains or, or Sri Lanka gains or anybody gains or loses. It is the US interest which is the foremost. And US will always be in a, a bilateral relationship only as long as it suits the US. We know the relationship between US and Iran. We know the relationship between US and Iraq. We know the diplomatic relation between US and Libya and the earl, earlier relationship and now. It's very, very clear. You are friends with US as long as they need you. After that, they can put you in the dumb house. Recently, there was this two plus two. You know, uh, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about you know giving names and all those things. For everything that we do, we have names. Three fundamental pacts have been signed between US and India. This is very important. Uh, gentlemen, this is not, uh, was not done in 2020 or 18 or 16. It has taken more than 10 years to come to this level. So India also has a running diplomatic core. Policies remain same, only optics change. You know, uh, if you go to a, a tea shop, I'm sure, most of them have seen us making, um, seen people making tea in Kerala. In the village, you have a tea shop where the guy makes a tea with that one meter tea. It's very interesting to see. But you come home, your mother doesn't, or you don't make, or your father, or your brother doesn't make a tea like that one meter tea. But you still have tea. It is the optics that is different. The tea essentially is the same. So. Essentiality of uh, Indo-US relations have remained like this for the last 30 years. It has been slowly and gradually being ratcheted up on firm footing. So in 2016, when we signed the LIMOA, LIMOA is a Logistic Exchange Memorandum of Agreement. It is to enable the Indian Army, Navy, Air Force to and US Marines, Navy, Air Force and Army to rely upon each other for the logistics requirement when they need. It is like if I am passing by your house and we are in agreement with each other, I can stop without asking, put the bell, enter and ask for a cup of tea. Of course, pay for it and then go. You come near my house, you can come into my house, ring the bell, ask for a cup of tea, pay for it and go. This is what Lemo is all about. Comcasa is a communication from compatibility and security agreement. Let me explain to you how it works. If I speak in, in if I speak in English and use only to understand Malayalam, how do we communicate? So we get something called the Google interpreter. So or you have an interpreter. When it comes to electronics, you have something called encryption equipment. So what we talk and what they talk is encrypted and can be heard by each other. Unfortunately for electronics, frequency is a major issue. So we now have equipment for Indian Army, Navy, Air Force with their counterparts in the US with similar equipment that can actually communicate with each other in peace and war. 
BECA or the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement for Geospatial Cooperation signed on 27 October 20, where the 2 plus 2 were the latest. It takes the relation into the outer space, missiles. For example, we want to launch a missile. We can bank on American satellite system to give us the exact location of our enemy spots. This is what we have agreed upon. With that, I have finished exactly 50 minutes. I have now opened the question because I thought I must give enough time for question answer. I am open to question answers. Thank you very much.